Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Focus TV. As always, joined tonight by Octavia Wyatt, Cardo Dudley Jr., Raymond Lyons, Wilson Tarpe Jr. We got a lot to get through. Uh, Going to check in with Octavia with the NFL, Raymond with the WNBA. Going to talk a little NBA with Cardell. Got some DC United, Jamal Hayward with the 9450 breakdown. Uh, Piss League opening day recap. Got some of that. And then, as always, Cardell's going to you know make sure we get out of here um, with a couple rapid fire questions because what well, better way to torment us at the end of every episode uh, with rapid fire? But Octavia, I'm going to go ahead and hand you the keys. NFL, what's going on in your league? So, um, we try to keep it as short as possible. You know, the NFL has a lot of its own, apparently. Um, biggest news coming out of the NFL currently um, this past weekend, there were 77 players or personnel from teams that tested positive for COVID-19 only to turn around to find out that those 77 positive tests were false positives. Um, they were able to track it back to a lab that was in New Jersey. Um, there were players from the Packers. Uh, there was at least 10 to 12 players there. So it was a really big deal. Um, 11 teams were affected in, in whole. Um, it altered a lot of the team's Sunday practices because um, the results came in. I think they said uh, their head coach got the call at like 2.51 in the morning that they have players that tested positive. So it altered their Sunday schedules. But after that, all people who tested positive falsely um, were able to get retested. They tested negative. They did also do a home care visit where they tested again and they tested negative again. And all of those people that were affected by that were able to return to the facilities and continue with practices on Monday. Um, the NFL is calling it an isolated incident. Um, they were able to fairly quickly track down where it happened. Apparently, there was some type of contamination um, with those individuals' tests. They were contaminated. They were able to rerun those same tests correctly without the contamination, and they all tested negative. So. Um, it was a pretty big scare. You know, that's the biggest fear going into this season is if there is a total outbreak like that happened in the MLB. Um, 77 players is a lot. Um, they use different testing facilities and they test with a, um, a company called BioReference. Um, and they use five labs around the nation. So they were able to pinpoint this one lab um, where, they, like I said, there were players that were affected by that and other teams as well. But they have since said that they have, you know, caught this. It was an irregular experience. So they don't foresee anything like this happening going forward. But in hindsight, you know, it's probably good something like this happened now and not during the season. So now they can take better procedures and protocols to make sure that this doesn't happen during the season. Because if this were to happen, that would be one of the biggest situations that they would have to deal with among uh, this COVID-19. In other news, um, over the weekend, safety Earl Thomas was released by the Ravens um, following an on-field fight that he had with fellow safety Chuck Clark. Um, they didn't really go into detail into what actually transpired. There's allegations that it had to do with a blown coverage um, by Thomas during a practice and which ensued in an argument. And eventually reports are that Earl Thomas punched him in the face. Um, so we all know that Earl Thomas has been having a rough year or so um, from him leaving Seattle the way he did, um, as well as he's had other situations going in his personal life with his wife and domestic uh, situation between them. So he's had a lot going on. Um, they even said that he had an, a similar situation um, with this. I don't think it escalated this high, but he had another situation 11 months ago during a practice or during a game where he got into it with another player. So the Ravens just cut all ties. They don't want to deal with it anymore. So he has been released as of Sunday. And the first team in line is the Dallas Cowboys, which I'm not surprised. 
Um, so we will see how that goes. <laughs> if they try to sign it, you know, Jerry's always down for a gamble. So <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. Um, I think, but I think with Earl Thomas, it's slightly different. I think he's just had like a, a bad year or so. He has a lot going on. I don't think he's a like some of these repeat offenders, but you never know nowadays. So, but like I said, Dallas apparently is interested. So we'll see if he ends up there or if he ends up anywhere else or if he ends up anywhere at all. Um, and some Washington football team news. Coach Ron Rivera did um, come out and state that he has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, he does still plan on coaching this year. Um, he was diagnosed with a squamous cell carcinoma located in his lymph node. Apparently, he um, found a lump in his throat, and he said after it, he said it was in July, and then he realized it didn't go away. So when he got tested, he just found out two weeks ago that it was cancer. Um, they did say they caught it very early and is very treatable. Um, he does, as of now, have a contingency plan in place or a plan B which he has not gone into detail about, but rumor speculations are that, you know, if for some reason he does have to step away from the team for a period of time, um, that Jack Del Rio would possibly step in as head coach in the interim. Um, he is the, you know, one of the coaches there that does have head coaching experience. And he did also step in in Denver when John Fox also had to take time away due to health issues. So, he is able to at least step in on the fly and hopefully it doesn't get to that. We, you know, we wish Ron, you know, to have a safe treatment. Um, they did say that he's supposed to take some type of test five to seven times a week, something like that. And um, for a period of time, he said that his doctors are on board with him still coaching and that um, he should do it until he feels like he can't. Um, he feels good as of now, but he did say that he heard that somewhere in the three to four week range, he could possibly really start feeling worse. Um, but they're trying to keep it as normal as possible now. So um, we wish him a speedy recovery, recovery and everything and hope this doesn't derail his coaching abilities for this, this season. And um, just to round it out, last but not least, um, if you have not heard, um, there was another shooting of an unarmed black man um, with Jacob Blake that happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, today, the Detroit Lions canceled their practice as a protest. Um, they said when they came into the facility today, they just didn't feel like that this was something that they could just sweep under the rug and that this is bigger than football to them. So they did address the media. Um, they did say that they want to use their platforms to bring awareness to these situations again and again. Um, and they just felt like that that was one way that they could also put their voices out there by canceling practice today as well. And they're, the team that was affected by this, as far as it being in their home state, the Green Bay Packers did also put out a statement in regards to the situation. Um, the Packers organization was shocked to see that the video that showed police shooting Jacob Blake multiple times in the back. We are hopeful Jacob makes a full recovery and our thoughts are, are with him and his family. While we understand a full investigation of this terrible incident will take place, we are deeply troubled at what again has become a painful example of the significant challenges we face with respect to police brutality, systemic racism, and injustices against Black people. We continue to call for meaningful dialogue to affect the needed change we all desire. Um, so just a couple of teams coming out. I'm sure um, if you haven't watched the NBA, and I'm sure Carl tapped into it as well, that's been another focal point that they've still been talking about while they're in the bubble. And it's just sad that we are still going through this situation. Um, and at the time the statement came out was before what was reported today. Jacob Blake's father has come out and stated that his son is um, paralyzed from the waist down. So uh, it's a blessing he's still alive, but it's still sad that he has to endure this situation for the rest of his life. But that's all I got for you guys today. All right, uh, I'm gonna pass this along very well stated. Pass this along to Ray. What's happening in the WNBA, sir? Oh man, uh, they they in the thick of things. It's, it's starting to heat up um, about two thirds of the way through the season. 
Um, the, the playoff picture is starting to round out a little bit, um, but, you know, it's still things are nowhere near finalized, of course. Um, it's like a game and a half between first and fifth place. Uh, Seattle's in first. Uh, they're 11 and three. Uh, Minnesota is in fifth. They're um, nine and four. You know, and those those five teams, man, it's, it's just going to be a slugfest down the stretch. Um, the um, top five teams are Seattle, uh, Vegas, the Sparks, Chicago, and um, and Minnesota. And uh, you know, it's a couple couple important games coming up. Uh, Minnesota and the Sparks play each other tomorrow, and um, Vegas and Seattle they play each other on Thursday. They actually just had a um, a really tough game on uh on Saturday when um Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart just went at it. Uh, it was great to watch. Uh Vegas came out with a victory. Uh, Asia Wilson had 23 and 14. Brianna Stewart had a uh, season high 29 and a career high 18 rebounds. Um so yeah, it was just just seeing two MVP candidates just going going at each other. Um and the MVP race is heating up as well. Uh you know, it's is four legit contenders right now. You got, of course, you got Candace Parker, uh, Asia Wilson, Breonna Stewart, and you know maybe the the person is not being talked about, but it's definitely right in the thick of it is um, Courtney Vandersloot from Chicago. I mean, she's she's just been driving the ship for them, and um, you know they're playing really well this year. She was she was actually just named Player of the Week for the Eastern Conference. Uh, she averaged nineteen and eleven over their last three games, leading Chicago to a three and zero record. Uh, Candace Parker was named Player of the Week for the Western Conference. She averaged uh, 18 points, almost 12 rebounds, and five assists. Uh, LA, LA was three and zero last week as well. Um, yeah, man, this is this is just some just some great basketball straight up. Like I I can't remember a time where it was this many people that could legitimately win this award, and it 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 would like if any one of these four wins, if they continue to play like this throughout the duration of the season. And any one of these four ladies are named MVP, I legit wouldn't have an argument against it. But um, but yeah, man, there things are getting going for them. Um, you know that that bottom half is is tight as well. You know the the top eight teams in the WNBA go to the playoffs, and it's uh shoot between seven and ten, it's a game and a half. So especially with this shortened season, every game holds that much more weight. So you, you got to come to play every single night. Um, focusing on the home team, uh, the Mystics, they, they're they still mathematically in the playoff hunt. You know, they of course, they've struggled this season. Um, you know, thing, things haven't really gone their way. And they, they came in shorthanded, but then injuries to the players that they had kind of um, – slowed them up even more. Uh, losing area powers was huge for them. But uh, Coach C brought in uh, Suge Sutton and Stella Johnson. You know, their their main focus now is pretty much development. Um, they're just trying to see who they can plug in next year when they when they get their full um, their full roster back. They're kind of I kind of liken them to the Nets on the NBA side where, you know, they got their big guns out and it's just um, a bevy of people that are pretty much auditioning at this point. Um, you know, Coach T, he, uh, he waived uh, Essence Carson and Shea Petty early in the season. You know, just nothing nothing against them. It was just a, a point in the season where he said, you know, our, we got to get young talent in and develop it to see we, what we can work with next year. And, you know, those two being veteran players, it just, um, you know, it just wasn't a, a fifth for them any longer. Um, but, yeah, the, the Mystics, they've been competitive as of late. Uh you know they they dropped a couple of close games um, on uh, on Sunday they played Phoenix and you know it, it took a vicious performance by Diana Taurasi you know for Phoenix to get that victory so you know the Mystics they're making some strides uh, it's it's definitely gonna be a rough stretch um, you know given their situation but you know I, I got full faith in them uh, their coaching staff is great you know they got players that um that are gonna fight so it's you know, it's not going to be one of those things where you just kind of throw in the towel. You know, I, I fully expect them to fight and compete for for one of those final uh, playoff spots. All right, what we're going to do? Take a quick break. When we get back, going to get into the NBA a little bit. 
of course, see what Jamal Hayward has for us this week on a 9-4-15 breakdown. But you're watching the Focus TV. We will be right back. Welcome back to the Focus TV. Thank you guys that have been watching since the start of the show. To those of you that just tuned in, welcome to this week's episode. All right, Octavia just talked a little NFL. Emma gave us a WNBA update. Cardell, the NBA, you know, uh, it felt like you, Raymond, and I were just talking about the NBA like 12 hours ago or something like that. But <laughs> everything's running together. Either way, it's the playoffs right now. Have the weather news award wise come out today, but what you got for us, man? Oh uh, man, a lot of you know news today. We're not gonna harp on what happened last night. We spoke on that. If y'all want to know what happened about um, last night's games, NBA outlook is up. Check it out there. But uh, gonna start off with some great news. Milwaukee Bucks for Giannis Antetokounmpo was named NBA Defensive Player of the Year. Um, in games played through March 11th, Antetokounmpo. Um, from the Bucks, he averaged uh, NBA's best defensive rating, 101.6 points per 100 possessions. Uh, with Giannis on the court, Milwaukee allowed only 96.5 points per 100 possessions, the lowest defensive rating among more than 300 players in the league who averaged at least 15 minutes a game. Uh, from beginning of the season through March 11th, Milwaukee's opponent shot an NBA low 41.3% from the field. Uh, Giannis held his matchups to 36.5% shooting from the field, the lowest percentage among the more than 250 players who faced at least 300 shots. Also, Giannis averaged an NBA high 11.5 defensive rebounds in games played, obviously through March 11th, when the league shut down due to the pandemic. Highlighted by nine games with at least 15 defensive rebounds. He also averaged a little over one steal and one block per game, making him one of only six players to average one or more in both categories. Um, I'm hearing a lot of people kind of, you know, you know, the, the Laker fan base is, you know, sometimes they can be delusional. Well, a lot of times they can be delusional. So they're saying, uh, you know, they feel AD should have won it. But, you know, when you look at everything, it, it shouldn't have been close and it wasn't close in the voting. So, you know, congrats to Giannis, man. And, you know, well-deserved. Um, we're going to see if he could pull off a, what I call the Jordan and the Lajuan. I uh, win the defensive player of the year and MVP in the same year. Um, moving forward, uh, Brett Brown was up on fire by the 76ers on Monday, you know, after Philly was swept on Sunday. Um, you know, it's just a, everyone can kind of see it coming. Once Ben Simmons went down, the Sixers didn't look good at all. And, uh, you know, the Boston, uh, Boston pretty much just put them out their misery. In uh, seven seasons, Brown finished with a overall record of 221 wins, 344 losses. But he's still old. $7 million over the remainder of his contract. So it's interesting to see who the next coach going to be. You know, there's all types of rumors. You know, Ty Lu, you know, kind of being the front runner. But we shall see. Depends on what happens with the Clippers and whatnot as they move forward in the playoffs. Uh, Toronto Raptors say that Kyle Lowry has been diagnosed with a left ankle sprain and that his condition will be updated as appropriate. Uh, you know, Toronto's Eastern Conference semifinal series against the Celtics begins this Thursday. Uh, with just a little more than three minutes left in the first quarter of Sunday's game for Lowry was driven up the floor and uh, he was cut off by Chris Chioza. Larry stepped um, Larry's uh, left foot stepped on Chioza's foot and um, the Raptors point guard he left off the court. Uh, the Raptors were 12 and 2, 12 and 2 in games this season without Lowry. Um, in the first three playoff games, obviously before he got hurt, Lowry averaged 16 points, 5.3 assists, and 8.7 rebounds uh, per game. Um, some more bad news, man. It's, 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 you know, starting to wear on guys. Damian Lillard, you know, obviously last night he pulled up on his drive during the third quarter of the Trailblazers blow. I lost to the Lakers and um, ass out of the game. Uh, by the fourth quarter, they said he was having an MRI on his right knee. Uh, the results came by inconclusive. Uh, he was smart and got a second opinion and then revealed that he indeed had a sprained right knee and he has been ruled out for game five against the Lakers. Um, I think they, you know, see the writing on the wall that they kind of overmatched. Guys are worn down. You know, Dane fought. 
that's all you're gonna ask from any superstar player. He came, he did his job, but it's no point in risking further injury that could take him in to possibly next year rehabbing and stuff like that. Let him get healthy, and, you know, let everybody get healthy and get ready. Um, because the Lakers pretty much got control of the series. And even more news, Dallas Mavericks big man Chris Stapsposingas has been ruled out for tonight's game five against the Clippers. Uh, it will be the second consecutive game Pozingas misses due to right knee soreness. Uh, you know, Sunday he was a late scratch before the Mavs game for overtime win. Uh, Rick Carlisle said the next afternoon that Pozingas could be a game time decision for tonight. Uh, but around noon today, they ruled him out due to his right knee soreness. They're trying to get him ready for game six and um, trying to you know keep him healthy for the playoff push. And that's basically all I have for right now. Uh, except for an update, Utah is leading the Denver Nuggets 81-72 with 3.54 left in the third quarter. Yes, um, you know, for Utah, uh, for Utah, got a chance to end this series tonight. That's look like they're game for it. Yeah, they definitely look like they're up for it. Um, they've been pretty sharp. You know, this postseason start to this postseason. So, uh, <laughs> unless Denver uh, changes something, Utah will be moving to the second round. All right. So, moving on, we're going to get into see what Jamal Hayward asked for us this week on the 9450 breakdown. Uh, it's a setup for L cut and breakdown of three options off of L cuts. It's a setup for an L cut and a breakdown of three options off of said L cut. We'll see. They're gonna, we're going to take a break right after that. And when we come back, give you guys a little DC United update, talk some Pitts League. And then we got the, you know, the most fun time of the night, rapid fire, all coming up here on the Focus TV. Welcome back to the Focus TV again. Especially thank you to Jamal Hayward for knocking out this installment each and every week. Hope that you guys are getting something from it. Uh, 
you know, I look forward to it each and every week just to see what part of the game he's breaking down. I feel like he's definitely insightful. Oh, man. So, DC United update. They are currently playing right now, but we got to get to that point. The Black and Red hit the road to play uh, FC Cincinnati on the 21st. They didn't get the result they wanted, but they did get a point um, in the standings due to a scoreless draw. A formation change was made, inserting Donovan Pines into the center of their three center back line. Um, and, you know, we saw that at times last year. Donovan's other three is probably the most athletic, has a lot of range. Um, you know, and uh, things have typically gone well. When they've done that, they weren't able to score, obviously, but they were a little bit more solid at the back. Uh, tonight, DC United is hosting the New England Revolution. They are staying, well, they attempted to stay with a 3 5 2, although. It wasn't with three center backs as it was Birnbaum, Pines, and Russell Knauss this time at the back with uh, Kevin P uh, Paredes, Junior Moreno, Felipe in uh, literally flat in midfield with the wings being Joseph Mora and uh, Gressel. Up top, they had Edison Flores and Kamara. In the 14th minute, they lost Russell Knauss, possibly a hamstring in uh, injury. Uh, Briant subbed, uh, subbed in for him in the 19th minute. Unfortunately for DC United, they are down one nothing as Gustavo Bo put his team up in the 26th minute. The game was delayed due to lightning, and it literally just started back up within the last couple of minutes. So it's it's good to see the MLS getting back to play. Um, you know, some media members out of there. You know, it was weird seeing the pictures that they took. Audi being empty, obviously. Um Fans are not allowed in D.C. at this time. Oh, the Pitts League did start. So if you guys have been following us on social media, you guys would know. Um, Pitts League opening day was this past Friday. Cardell, Raymond, and myself were all in attendance. Um, again, make sure you guys are following us on Twitter at The Focus TV and on Instagram, especially for every Friday. There's uh, four games on Friday nights, two of which have been dubbed the primetime games, and those are the two that we live stream. But just to give you guys a quick overview of what happened on Friday, power movement beat team pressure 58-50. Uh, Alpha Bengura led power movement with 14 points. Freddie Liriano had 13 to pace team pressure. Damage Crown beat Nellis Realty Group 72-70. Isaiah Tate had 19 for Damage Crown in the win. Jimmy Jenkins had a game-high 24 points for Nellis, Reality, uh, Nellis Realty Group. Sorry, Sam's Balls beat Free Love Mob 60-54. Mo Creek paced Sam's Ballers with a game high 25 points. Omar Austin and Matt Bonds had 16 and 15 points, respectively, for Free Love Mob. Running Gun beat Deadstock DMV 65 52. Aaron Anderson with 17 to lead Running Gun, while Vincent Murphy and Tyrone Cook scored 13 apiece for Deadstock DMV. Also, for daily updates, because games are happening not only just. Follow at the Pits League on Twitter and Instagram. And a special thanks to Free Alexander for taking care of this week's, uh, well, for Friday's top 10 plays. And Cardell? Oh, man. Yeah, you get uh, some time tonight to work for us with rapid fire. <laughs> time is no, it's all your good. favorite. Oh. I mean, it's, it's, it's good to you. Don't be scared, man. Come on, though. You, you sound like LeBron in a post conference, press conference. Like, come on, man. You be all right. Uh, we're going to uh, the Cowboys. Jerry Jones, he said it's absolutely fair. Some teams will have fans and others won't. Oh, um, quit, man. Uh, Vice head coach Mike Zimmer and Irma have taken issue with the lack of uniformity with. Zimmer calling it a competitive disadvantage and McDermott referring to it as ridiculous. I always wanted Jerry Jones sees it differently. He said it's absolutely fair on 105.3 The Fan on Tuesday. The benefit of crowds are important to sports. On the other hand, isn't it possible to have great games without it? You saw one the other night in basketball, but it's fair. We've made up our minds that this thing isn't going to be one way or the other. Surely about evening up evening up everything that could be competitive, you got to have to adapt to the virus, attendance being one of them. And to the end that we can get fans and join these games with the experience similar to the thing they've become accustomed to, it's a big step in the right direction. 
Uh, you know, normally they always start ladies first with our table. I, I think the, the cowboy guys, I mean, what's up with y'all? <laughs> Explain this to us. Make sense Man, to us. I'm a, uh, you know, usually when people ask me about stuff Jerry Jones do, I just chalk it up to senility. I mean, it's, I, I honestly don't pay attention to him when he talks. I'm sorry, but. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he he kind of needs to go away, but um, I mean it's it's obviously an advantage, you know, if some some teams are playing with fans and others aren't. Uh, it's it's a different atmosphere, is is a different feel. If if you ever play sports, you you know this. I mean, it yeah, the, it needs to be. I, and I do, I do think it needs to be some type of standard across the board, you know, because I guess it's just a, yeah, man, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be the same for everybody, uh, level playing field, like, um, just like you know, in the in these bubble situations, you know, everybody's under playing under the same conditions, um, you know, in now in those specific games, yeah, it's it's the same condition because you know if you're playing on the road. And you're playing against the other team, and they have fans. Your your fans aren't going to be there, but it's it's just too. You can't go from a, a empty stadium one week to playing at a half house the next week. You know what I'm saying? So I, yeah, Jerry just got to take his meds and and go in the back. <laughs> Octavia, he said take his meds though. <laughs> Before this, I didn't even really think about that. Um, I, I didn't really think about it, but it I see both sides of it, and I honestly don't think they're gonna be able to come to some type of decision that's gonna make everybody happy. Um, because on one side it's city and state it's city and state regulations of who's allowing people in and out. So like the NFL can't trump that. And then on the other side, you know, people are trying to get at least halfway, you know, some type of capacity in there because they still want to make some type of money. They still want to, you know, I I think it was the Miami Dolphins um, arena at Hard Rock, Hard Rock Arena. Like they already have like they said, like you could prepackage to buy your, your food in advance. They're going to send you a text message when it's available so you don't have to stand in line like these arenas are big money makers for them so they're still trying to make sure that they can try to cash out on something but i don't think it's fair for one team to be able to have fans and then the other team has none and like you said there's no continuity of going you know to one game one game one week at this place where they don't have like if they go to metal i said metal lands it's not metal lands anymore but if they were to go to um where the giants and the jets play Nobody will be there. Um, but if they go to Jerry's World, you know, they're going to have 20% of people if that's what they're planning on doing. So I don't think there's any way that they're going to be able to come to an agreement of what can and what can't because there are places that they just can't have fans there at all. And then the people that can, they're going to feel like, well, why should we be penalized if we can and y'all can't? You know, we're in a lower state. You know, we don't have a lot of cases here or, or, or whatever it's going to be. So... I don't think they're going to come to a consensus. Good points, Octavia. Good points. Uh, Wilson, on you. Uh, yeah, it's – look, man, Gary's going to have people in his building. The state allows it. So it is what it is. They'll be there to either win or lose. Um, it's also the NFL. So my interest or caring factor here is like at a whole negative two. Um, as long as the players are safe, the fans thing is – that's that's further down that list. Um, also, we already know, man. Sports is it's there's it's money driven, right? Um, like Octavia Octavia said, there's a lot of I know folks don't even think about it, but even before even thinking about fans, there's a lot of game day staff, all that stuff that's affected by the pandemic, everything that's going on. Um, so if you can have some percentage of fans there, that also means some folks have a percentage of possibly getting their jobs back for a little bit. Again, this is if everything can be done in a safe manner, but yeah, it's not going to be fair. It's the NFL, man. When has stuff ever been fair there? Like some people are going to have fans, some people are not. Um, and also for the teams that do have fans, I wish you the best because the folks 
that don't have home fans almost all year, they will be getting up each and every time. The, the teams that have fans, you're getting circled like a couple more times on the schedule every week. That that Those rides can be a little bit more amped up because they're not playing in front of their folks. They're going to make sure you suffer in front of yours, which means which makes me extremely petty person, very happy for all of this. I'm here for it. Again, it's a safety thing. Every state, this country's done a horrible job dealing with the pandemic, clearly. Uh, this st- every state has took it upon themselves to even do even better or raise raise this ridiculous bet to do even worse. So, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, I'm with Octavian. NFL's not doing anything uniform. <laughs> There's no bubbles for the football. Yeah, it's like if they had a bubble, it's like it would make more sense. But they – they did say that at one point that they are leaving a bubble atmosphere in the cards, possibly if they get to playoffs. So, like, if there's a playoff, then they'll possibly do a bubble, which I feel like is asinine because it's like by then, like, it's less teams. And now you want to do a bubble when they made it through the whole season. But whatever. But who knows? It's the NFL. Hey, shout out to Rodney because that's where I was going to say if someone does the bubble. I bet she's going to be in Dallas. Oh God, please. They're not gonna make the playoffs. I'm gonna play, I'm playing. Oh man. The petty side well, of God it. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> they could, I guess they could still be the host though, right? Because uh, usually like whoever hosts the Super Bowl doesn't make it, but you know, I mean, that's just my petty you know, side. Don't mind. You know Jerry likes his money. Jerry loves his money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love his money. <laughs> Be like, you see, you see this? I can call um, you from the phone. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly what's gonna be. Um, 76 of GM Elton Brand says, I'm not looking to trade Ben Simmons or Joel and Embiid. Uh, since he's taken over, uh, and Philadelphia has kind of been in the mix when he was gonna get into the playoffs, uh, a lot of players have changed JJ Reddick, Robert Covington, Dario Sarrett. Markel Fultz, Jimmy Butler, Tobias Harris, Al Horford, Josh Richardson um, have been interchangeable. Obviously, Brett Brown is gone, but Ellen Brand remains committed to Embiid and Simmons as centerpieces. Uh, he said, I'm not looking to trade Ben or Joel. I'm looking to compliment them better. They're 24, 26 years old, respectively. You try to make that fit as long as you can. Um, they want to be here. They want to be with our organization. I see them here for a long, long time. Uh, what are your thoughts? We're going to start with you, Octavian. Would you seek a trade for those guys or would you do what um, Ellen Brand is doing, give them more time to try to build around them? Um, I'm kind of up in the air with this too because you look at them as individual players and they're both great individually. But to me, what we always talk about is the, it's the chemistry thing. You know, um, You've moved all these other different pieces around them, whether they were good enough or not. You know, you you moved all these pieces around. There's been rumblings that, like, you know, the whole situation with Jimmy Butler, like, I guess at what point do they feel comfortable with blowing it up? And obviously, Elton Brand isn't there yet. But to me, it's like it's dragging. Like, it's just like every year it's worse and worse to watch. And... I kind of give them a little bit of a pass for this just because of the situation of the pandemic and then Ben Simmons getting hurt. So I understand it maybe not being a priority this off season, but like this next year for them has to be make or break. It's like either y'all get the pieces in here now for next year or let them, you know, do something else. Like let them explore. Cause like at the end of the day, like, yeah, he says they're committed, but how do we not know that Joel and B is in the back end like, I'm ready to get out of here, you know, or Ben Simmons like, I'm ready to get out of here because they're running out of people to blame at this point. You know, we got rid of all those players. They, they fired the coach now. At this point, if, if y'all two don't, if they don't make it work, like, I feel like it, it, they should just blow it up and start over. All right, Wilson. Uh, yeah, I'm interested to see how they plays out. Um, I do think like maybe a better complement of players would 
help the two of them because you can't just put – you have to have shooters on the floor with those guys. Otherwise, this thing is not going to work. Um, but at the same time, when his availability and, you know, him and being in shape and all that, those things, you know, if I was going to move them, I'm probably seeing what I could get for him and probably building around Ben if I had to pick or choose. But I don't blame the old brand for trying to exhaust – you know, do your best exhaust every avenue with those two before making that opportunity because of their age, you still have a chance um, to try to retool the things around them. But again, like Octavia said, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes or if folks really still want to be together like that anyway. So um, I'm not mad at Elton Brand for, you know, giving it another go or trying to better put uh, to, to upgrade the pieces around them. But you know, if push comes to shove, you know, it is what it is. All right, Raymond. Yeah, um, you know, basically I just checked the temperature between uh Embiid and Simmons. Like Octavian Wilson said, if they if they still committed to making it work, then yeah, I I'd, I'd give it another go. I mean, they were one one shot away from the finals last year. So um or well uh what round was that they played Toronto? That was the semis. Uh, oh, yeah. Was, yeah. They were a shot away from the conference yeah. finals, yeah. They shot away conference. from the conference finals, yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like they don't have the capacity to be successful. But, um, but yeah, it's t- time is time is ticking. Um, you know, this year it was an anomaly with the pandemic and, and Simmons getting hurt. Um, but I think uh, – I think getting rid of Brett Brown was was the right thing to do in this situation because he had seemingly lost the locker room, and you know at, at that point it's it's not much you can do. Um, you you got to go in another direction from that standpoint. But uh, in regards to to on court, I mean, you know they yeah they they got to figure it out, man. They, they're two young talented players. And of course, the, some onus is on the front office to get the pieces around them for them to maximize their potential. But, um, but yeah, at at some point, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to fall on the player's shoulders because um, they're the ones out there doing the job. But yeah, I, next year is, is going to be pivotal for them. Um, you you got to make some personnel changes. Um, of course, you got to get a solid coach in there. Um, this. I don't think uh, if I'm Elton Brand, I'm not giving somebody a, their, their chance here. I'm getting a veteran coach that can come in and steady the ship and, and get these guys to where they want to be. But, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, if next year is a, a disappointment in any way, you know, you might have to think about moving one of those guys. And me personally, I'd I'd keep Simmons and um and try to move and beat. Yeah, I feel I kind of feel the same. Uh, I wouldn't give up on them just yet, but I will, you know, let them feel that heat a little bit. You know, sense of urgency, like the grace period is over. You know what I mean? Y'all got to, uh, man, you got to get in the gym. You got to develop a jumper. And B, we tired of seeing you in and out of shape. You got to be in shape. And that's going to start with who he hires as coach. Like, I will get a coach that will get up, get up in him. You know what I mean? I think um, – Brad Brown may have lost the locker room, but I think he was also limited because, you know, upstairs, sometimes upstairs limit what a coach can do. He might have wanted to do things that upstairs was like overruled him. Like, you can't do that. You know what I mean? And and, and it grew to be a bigger problem. You know what I mean? So I, I will give it another chance, get some veteran pieces around them that aren't afraid to challenge both of them. You know what I mean? But still do their jobs and will be respected and have a coach that will make sure that this is what it is because um you know it, it's it's too much of the same things that kind of catches up with them when it comes you know to playoff time all the little shortcomings you, you know you see it during the season where it's like uh you know they up and down simmons don't want to shoot here and there or whatnot and then mb in and out he want to play this game then he get called out then he who it's just too much of that man all that immature stuff that needs to go away because you know how the business work if Ellen Brand don't make the right decision in the next couple of years he may not be there to determine what happens period so mm-hmm. like I'm not gonna have my job on the line because you fools don't want to get with the program like right, we gonna have we gonna we have to have that grown man talk and I can care less about feelings and all that man because you're a professional 
you need to conduct yourselves as such. And that's just the reality of what it is. But definitely get some veteran leadership up in there that, that, that would challenge them and do that. They could do the job, shoot, defend, and also uh, get, get a coach, man, that will get up in them. And that's just the way it is because they're too talented, man. You know, like even with Simmons out fine, you can't beat the Celtics. But MB should be talented enough to get a game or two. He should be talented. He's talented enough to dominate. And just look, I'm gonna win us a game too. Just like with Luca did the other night with our Porzingis. Like we we gonna win this game. They was down 20, 20 something. You know what I'm saying? That's what great players do. So, you know, it, the time is ticking though. Um next up, you know, we'll talk about uh Duke's upcoming recruiting class. Um they they got a nice little boost. Um uh, Banchero, you know, he ranked third in ESPN's uh 2021 class. Uh, he committed to Duke. Uh, he's a six nine center. Uh, he had been heavily recruited by Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, he's the second top ten recruit for Duke, which also has received the commitment from AJ Griffin, um, ESPN's number nine recruit in the twenty twenty one class. For those that may not know, AJ Griffin is the son of Raptors assistant. Um, uh, uh, I forget his name too. Um, Griffin. He's this um, the, the top assistant. He actually won a game in the bubble. They let him coach a couple games, be the head coach at the end. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, he has NBA pedigree. Mm-hmm. He's a monster. I right? saw him out slam dunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's a beast. So they got a vicious class coming. Like it is, it's, it's outside of maybe Kentucky. It's rare you see a program get two top twenty-one, top ten recruits in a class coming, who are also projected to be possible top five picks the following year in the draft for 20, um, 2022. Um, they, right now, they remain the only program with two top 10 commitments. Uh, as far as man, sure, I checked them out last time at Top 100, can't be UVA. And um, I walked out, it was the first time I seen him in person, but I walked out saying he was the best player in the gym. Um, the powers that be for the Top 100 camp obviously thought so. They named him MVP as well. Um, think he, he he basically could do – he's basically Ben Simmons, but more of a scorer. Ben Simmons is more of a passer, but he has a mid-range jumper. And that's scary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's the thing we looking at Ben like, in that he has to develop a, uh, his range out the three-point range, but he has a nice pull-up jumper. He can, he can shoot out the post and whatnot to complement what he brings physically and athletically, man. He, he You know, he's a monster. Um, you know, what I said about him last year, you know, he was MVP of the camp. He put on one of the best performances of the last few years at the camp um, with the top 100 players in the country. He was dominant at times. Um, he did damage from inside and from mid-range. He averaged 17.2 points, 5.8 rebounds, and three steals on 65% shooting from the field, 20% from, from three-point range, and 87% from the, from the free throw line. Um, you know, he put on the show throughout the camp, and the thing's averaging 25 points, five rebounds, five steals on 73% shooting from the field. 94% shooting from the free throw line over his final two games. At the time, he had offers from Duke, North Carolina, and Kentucky. Obviously, he just committed to Duke. Um, you know, like I said, man, he he's already there. He's he's already there as far as the tools, man. If he could just um, just add a respectable three point, I'm not one of these guys where your game is all predicated on three point shooting. If he had a respectable uh, three point shot at Duke, man. Yeah, he he he's definitely in the running for the top pick, man. He's that special. Um, obviously, um, you know, Rodney's playing the uh, highlights or whatnot. Just uh, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing so far? We saw what saw was you, Raymond. Um, yeah, man, he he looked like the real deal. Um, yeah, I had um, I haven't had the opportunity to see him play, but uh. But you know he's he's got the size. He look like his skill set's pretty rounded out. Um, I like the the main thing I liked was um, the defensive plays. Like it's not just the big emphatic blocks. Mm-hmm. It's him going straight up, challenging shots, not fouling. You know, being disciplined. You know, using his length and athleticism. Um, I I think that'll that'll go a long way at um at Duke and at the the next level. Um, yeah, that, that mid-range is important. It looks like he's comfortable with it. You know, he's comfortable handling the ball. Um, you know, like you said, if he uh if he can make it as to where you gotta honor his three point mm-hmm. shot, then that'll just open up the whole court for him. Um, you know, is is it's gonna be interesting to see like how much he actually develops in college because 
like I, I feel like the the climate that we're in now, you just get these super talented guys for one year that are, are just thoroughbreds and head and shoulders above everybody, and they go in and you know and just live off their talent and are successful in college. But then they don't add what they need to add to have um, a more of an immediate impact at the NBA level. So I mean, I I don't think that'll be something to worry about with with Coach K because um you know that that program is it speaks for itself um but yeah man i'm i'm excited to see him play uh it's it it, it might be a <laughs> might be some real damage done for, for that one year in college but um but yeah it'll, it'll be good to see him see him uh see him live Mark Taylor. it's funny how you said the damage done in one year because he would be one of that um <laughs> uh just seeing the highlights um how tall and big he is like and i love the comparison of like a ben simmons because to me like i like ben simmons's size and his game but not having that that, that jumper does to me kind of take him down or not but to for somebody to play like that and to then commit to duke where you know duke is a quote-unquote powerhouse but they've struggled in the last year or two so for them to get a recruit like this i i'm actually excited to see them play and see how especially with you know COVID going on and how they're able to do this like i'm hoping that that doesn't mess up his year because you know a lot of them just go to school for the one year because they have to but if something happens with covid who knows if he might just end up in the nba next year you never know um but to see why he chose duke and you know part of the reason saying that it was his frequent contact that he had with coach k and and the flexibility and the the leeway that they're going to give him which i don't see why they why they shouldn't so um I'm sure there are a lot of happy Duke fans. Uh, I'm about to start like a personal beef with Coach K right now because he keeps getting people <laughs> that wow, play for his school. I don't like Duke. I'm not allowed to like Duke. But this is like the third person where I'm going to end up watching Duke games and I like the talent. Please stop doing this, sir. It is hurting me. It is so irritating. Like, it is really irritating. Uh, I <laughs> I watched every time Zion was playing, I watched. I, I watched when Tatum was playing. You about to have me watching again. It, uh, it just hurts, man. That's all. But I'm looking forward to seeing what the kid can do. All right, man. Uh, last question. Going back to the NFL side, Cardinal safety, Buddha Baker. Um, uh, heading into his final year on his rookie contract, has agreed to a four year, $59 million extension. According to multiple reports, the 24 year old Baker started all 16 games last year and was credited with a league high 104 solo tackles. Uh, Baker made the Pro Bowl on special teams as a rookie. And they made it last year on defense. Um, he said it's all season that he's expecting his best year yet because it will be his first NFL season not having to learn a new defense. Uh, just what are your thoughts on uh, the Cardinals signing this guy to an extension? Uh, Wilson, we're going to start with you since you have to see a lot of them. Oh, man. Uh, all jokes aside, because I definitely got joke, especially how George is dribbling him off the turf. But um, he's probably uh, – he's his game resembles – it's kind of like a, like say you wanted to go shop for a honey badger, but you didn't have enough bread. Mm -hmm. That's probably that's yeah. like it's not a bad thing, right? And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. Like I know some people are making fun of him, like, oh man, he's getting all that money. Doesn't have interceptions. Like I hear that, and that's wonderful. Sometimes we don't hear a safety's name. It also means they're doing their job. He's he's a good player, all right. Yep. He's he's a very good player. Um, he's a very good young player. They get to build around him. Um, it doesn't bother me at all because we got a kiddo, but that's his business. But he's a very good young player. He's very deserving of that money. So for everyone, like, he doesn't have any picks. Uh, why is he getting paid? Chill out, man. Y'all were really excited when Jamal Adams was a free agent. That man got, like, two picks. Like, watch the <laughs> game and enjoy it. People, 
everyone's not freaking Ed Reed, right? Um, secondly, there's like a there's like ten really good safeties in the league, and probably four of them that everybody knows, like with uh, from uh, on like a household level. So that's a personal thing. The kid's a good player, man. He, he's really getting covered. And, you know, for example, that highlight right there, did he get the pick? No, but he broke on the ball. What did it lead to? A pick. Lucky there. Um, he's a good player, man. It was definitely worth the money. And it was smart of the Cardinals, I feel. Lock him up early because in like two years, you got to pay uh, Kyler and you're not going to have money left for things. So it was a job well done by Arizona. All right. Raymond. Um, man, first things first, if he led the league in tackles as a safety. That means he's getting a lot of work back there. So um he he's probably bailing him out a whole lot, you know, how if if he don't make a few of them tackles, how many of them go for six, you know? So um so yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's good for both parties. You know, he he gets a, a decent contract. Um you know, Arizona locks him up. Uh, say like that he comes out this year and has a monster year. <laughs> Price going up on a brick, man. So, you know, you you got it. You got a good young player. You know, he's he's performed well. He's ascending. You know, just just go ahead and do and do right by him. Um, no need to drag it out or put yourself in a position where you got uh some tough decisions to make. But um, but yeah, like Wilson said, you know, it's if you're if you're if you're hearing the safety's name a lot, it's one of two things. You're really good at your job or you're really bad at your job. You can hear his name a lot for, you know, making plays and getting interceptions and things like that. Or you can hear his name a lot because he's getting beat deep in coverage. So, you know, it good good move for, for, for them. Um, you know, glad they locked him up. You know, it's it's good to see NFL players actually paying people. Um but yeah, uh, Wilson. I know you're not worried, but you know the rest of that division. Uh, they probably got some things to worry about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For now, go ahead, go on, Taylor. No, nah, like, no. Nah, again, I'm not being funny. Like, he's really good. Like, again, the biggest thing over there that worries me is a little dude running around that terrorizes people. I'm worried about the other little dude. Yeah. He gives me nightmares. Kind of scary. <laughs> I'll take it on you. Yeah, um, y'all said all the good points, though. I will say that because what I was really thinking about is getting him locked into a contract now because you can see that he has steady progression each year. And the what you saw last year was really, really good. Like, a lot of teams would love to have a safety like that, i.e. my team. Yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. why not? Like, you, you see the trajectory for him. All he's doing is getting better and better and better. So why not lock that up, like you said, especially because you are going to have to pay Kyler soon. That's to me, that was like the biggest takeaway from it. So get him comfortable, let him know he's there, and then worry about Kyler in the years coming. But I've seen him play a couple of games. And, and like you said, just because you don't hear his name a lot or interceptions and stuff like that, when you don't hear his name a lot, that means they're not throwing the ball at him. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they see him over there like, nah, we're good over there. But congratulations to him. Uh, I always say, like, if you could get as much money as you can, especially in the NFL, as much of it is guaranteed as you could possibly get, take it. And, and if the organization feels as though he's the right fit for them and they got the money to give it to him, proud of him, and, you know, hopefully he proves them right. Yeah, I definitely think he will. And then because that division is like chess and people are betting in there, I love that he reset the safety market. So uh, Seattle, with Jamal Adams, Jamal Adams, is him and his representation going to look at Buda Baker and be like, that's Buda Baker. Give me double what he's getting. Price that man out the division. Great job. Good job, Cardinal. Get that man out of here. Can't pay for everybody. I want to thank you guys for hanging with us this evening. Um, it's been a blast as always. Follow us along on our social mediums. Get over to findersmag.com, mybundlesports.com. We'll see you guys back here next week, same time, same place. Thank you all. Good night. Bye, guys.